Michelle, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Brittany. I'm Michelle Zafino. I am founder of My Librarian in the Stacks and a young adult author. I received my master's in library and information science from University of Pittsburgh in 2012. And I've been living in San Francisco for 15 years. Before that, I am from the East Coast and I lived in New York and worked there at Hearst Publications, Hearst Magazines. And I would love to talk to you more about My Librarian. It's a really exciting time for us because our app is launching and we're looking for librarian ambassadors to help spread the word. So there's lots to, lots to share. But I believe one of the questions on the list was how I decided to enter library school. And I am a writer, and I decided to return to library school to have an arena for which to uh, research and do the genealogy background for my third book. And during the writing process of most of my novels, this is my first book, How Good It Can Be, and the second book is The Love Quad. They're published by In the Stacks Publishing, and they're available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and uh, all the places where you can buy books online, and the paperback is coming out. But I have always been a huge user of libraries and supporter of libraries. Ever since I was a child, I had my first library card at age four, and we had the bookmobile that came to our neighborhood. The library was honestly just two, three miles away, but we still had a bookmobile that came. So that was a part of my childhood and also going to our public library, Warren Public Library in Warren, Pennsylvania, was uh, where I grew up and I went there all the way through high school and in college I went to University of Pittsburgh for undergrad and I went to Hillman Library all the time and in New York I went to the New York Public Library and you know was, I've always been a huge huge supporter of libraries and a huge reader so when I moved to San Francisco and started writing my novels I started exploring library science and at that time San Jose didn't have the distance learning and I didn't want to have to commute to San, you know, from San Francisco to San Jose. So I went back to my alma mater for graduate school, even though it was out of state. I did the program over four years. So from 2008 to 2012, because I wanted to take my time and also work. Uh, at the time I was working as a fashion and beauty copywriter for places like uh, Paracone Skincare, uh, Sephora, uh, Men's Warehouse, Banana Republic, et cetera. I had a lot of uh, fashion and beauty copywriting clients. And so I basically worked my way through graduate school. And it was really interesting because at the time, uh, all of those businesses were going online. And so I was learning about content, content management systems and SEO keyword tagging and all these really, really wonderful things that uh, translated to library science. But at the time I entered graduate school, the first semester I was finishing my second book, The Love Quad. And then the next year, I started to research and do the genealogy for my third book, uh, which is called Allegra. It's a historical novel set in Renaissance Rome. And then I started another book, uh, which is a memoir. And uh, I started that during my last year of graduate school. And then since then I've written Library and Detective, my fifth book. So not all of them are released, but I do have five books and I'm starting to write more, <laughs> but the last few years, I've been concentrating on the other half of what I started in graduate school. I did independent studies in graduate school. One was for the genealogical research, and I did another independent study on uh, book talking or video book reviews. And that project turned into In the Stacks, which has turned into My Librarian. And it's a very like, long, <laughs> uh, exciting journey, but there's a lot of detail to go into because I did start you know, producing the content in 2008 during grad school. And I did 10 book talking videos for that class. 
and it just i really really loved what people were doing on youtube and i think maybe because i'm in san francisco and in the bay area but all these things were just coming to me and you know just early on and i was exposed to you know youtube years ago and you know wordpress websites i started um blogging in 2007 and because i wanted my own website and i was always uh, into um being able to maintain them myself. So I learned, you know, how to build WordPress websites and in graduate school also took a class on digital libraries and also information architecture. And so when I graduated, I started working on in the stacks, which years later we incorporated as my librarian in 2018. And I also went from copywriting to working as a information architect, organizing information on the front and back ends of websites, and that falls under UX. So there's a lot of moving parts here. So I'll be happy to talk more about UX and information architecture. Be happy to talk more about book talking, and I'm happy to talk about uh, you know my writing and you know how to start working as an author. And another thing that I wanted to mention is uh, the uh, data in the back end of my librarian. I also would love to talk about that and uh, how we have crafted this data, data set and taxonomized it. And that powers the book, the app. So you'll have to let me know what you would like me to elaborate on. And uh, a lot of this was self-started. Especially uh, after graduate school, I went back and I got my uh, front end development boot camp. So I learned JavaScript and jQuery. And myself and another librarian, uh, we built the first version of In the Stacks, the book recommendation tool, which was a web app. And we demoed it at the Mechanics Institute here in San Francisco in 2016. So it's important to note that I do a lot of this part time and then I also do a lot of the, you know, I spend part of my time working for pay or I did until 2018. So it was very slow going. And recently when I have focused, things have started moving faster. Oh. Let me know what you'd like to know and I, I'm happy to talk more. Thanks, Michelle. That was a great intro. Um, I know that I'm sure a lot of people are going to have uh, questions about that, especially information architecture. We hear that a lot in our classes um, mm -hmm. and user experience. So um, again, for those of you that may have just joined us recently, uh, we welcome all the questions that you have. Just toss them in the chat. Lauren is going to be moderating that for us. And um, we do, uh, the executive committee of ASSIST, we do have a few questions that we have already um, jot down previously and we are going to be uh, asking Michelle right now to sort of guide this discussion and then at the end um, at least the last 10-15 minutes we want to hear from all of your questions. Um, so I'm just going to launch right into it. Uh, you already talked a bit about it, about it Michelle but can you describe a little bit more about what My Librarian is? I know you said that you started it from in the stack and now you have My Librarian which is this app in sight um, and a book discovery site. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how does uh, my librarian set apart? How is it apart from the other book discovery sites out there? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Well, we like to think of ourselves as the new Goodreads, but we're entirely curated by librarians. And I just so happen to have the app on my Android phone. It's so exciting. We actually have a internal beta now on the, this has been a long time coming, maybe two years or more, but we do have it on um, my Android phone and I've been working, um, working on the bugs with the latest, you know, developer team. And uh, it will be phone gap to iOS and available on test flight. And I don't know about this version. This version is honestly just to show investors and partners, but uh, it's a way to discover life-changing stories. And 
You can log in and once you do, you'll see a scrolling list of keywords. So it, it's meant to mimic the reference desk experience. So when you would go into a library and say to a librarian, uh, what book should I read? And they would take you through the reference desk interview, which is, uh, you know, uh, where do you want the book to be set? What other kinds of books do you read? Who are your favorite authors? How do you want to feel? What kind of book do you want to read? Like, like by genre or you know what kind of uh level reading level like you want to read uh like a literary fiction or do you want to read non-fiction or you know comics graphic novels <laughs> and uh so we have a scrolling list of keywords and you see what you would like or you search for a keyword and you could say i want to read a mystery set in new york with a little room romance you know and i love like kelly stanley who is a, actually a san francisco mystery writer but uh, <laughs> Anyway, let's say she writes one in New York. So that they would the recommendation engine would take those criteria into account and they would give you a top five books, you know, based on what librarians have loved and reviewed. So there's a lot going on underneath the hood, but that's basically what the app does. And then the user has the option to add it to a bookshelf as already read or add it as want to read. And uh, there's been a lot of complaints about Goodreads, you know, not being user friendly. And since they were acquired by Amazon, I, you know, it's true. I don't think they've improved much at all. They've just kept it going. So we want to be the new Goodreads, especially because Goodreads calls librarians. They call it like people on their staff librarians and they don't have degrees. So all of the technology, all the people in, that have gone and worked on the app, they actually do have master's degrees. So we just hope this product values librarians, you know, intelligence, librarian brains, and, you know, takes uh, the opinions into account when giving, you know, book recommendations. We think that librarian recommendations are more diverse and more unbiased. And uh, I just, we feel like there's a real need for this as an author. And especially when you look a lot of, at a lot of the bestseller lists and it's all the same authors, the same you know, uh, authors that publishers want to promote in like, you know, the same genders, the same race. Like we just look at, like we feel that librarians review a more diverse kind of book and recommend more diverse books. So is that kind of what sets uh, my librarian apart then from other app discovery, book discovery apps and sites? is the librarian yes. aspect. Everybody working on it is a librarian. Cool. In many of those sites are based on social um, criteria. So you're also looking at what your friends have read. And we think that keeps you in a bubble of, you know, group think. We feel like these are impartial recommendations. And uh, a lot of those recommendations are based on, you might also like, you know, that sort of like, criteria, like a, what's the last book you read, that sort of thing. And then the, you might also like based on just that, and we give more diverse criteria. And a lot went into our recommendation engine and the brain. It's a data set that we'd run through a larger book catalog. We were using Internet Archive, but they went, they're having some issues with publishers right now. So we ended up using Google Books, I believe. But that will probably change. will probably vary, you know, which data, you know, which book corpus we use to run through and actually give the recommendations. Because most of the first ones that come up are actual like books that have been reviewed from librarians, but then it does go into like similar books to those. So there are some read-alikes, but the first few thousand will be books that we actually have reviews for. That's awesome. Thank you. So I know that you've kind of touched on this um, a lot, but I guess what was kind of the aha moment that you were inspired to create a book discovery tool? Well, it was a lot of exploring and I knew that I was having a difficult time publishing and marketing my own books. Luckily, I was able to, I, all right, um, let me back up. I pitched my first two books to over 75 agents and it, it was at the time where publishing was just changing so much that, that what you had to do to actually get repped by an agent and you know 
signed by a traditional publisher, it was just becoming so difficult because the budgets were going down and also they wanted social proof beforehand. So they wanted to already, they to already have a built-in audience so they could be guaranteed of selling a lot of books, basically. <laughs> so when I started shopping the books around, first of all, it was in the Twilight era. This was, it was a long time ago. It was 2006, 2007. And uh, so I, would, I shopped them around at the time and everyone was reading uh, those kinds of books the fantasy, young adult fantasy, paranormal romances. And then luckily the John Green, you know, era came out, you know, so that was really, really cool. But by that time, um, I feel like uh, I still didn't have the audience enough to be an attractive asset for like, to be signed by a publisher, which is so strange because I have a publishing background. I worked in magazine publishing, but still it was just really, really, really hard to get signed by a traditional publisher. It may be a blessing in disguise because you, if you indie publish, you have control over your own files. So I actually started, I had already had in the stacks and we were doing book content, but then I started the publishing part and uh, put out the books underneath uh, in the stacks publishing. And so that first began generating revenue, which was exciting. So one of my, my first book got put on a syllabus at a University of Texas branch campus. And so that was a lot of sales that semester. It was really exciting. It was a freshman English composition class. So I loved that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, but just marketing the books that I was indie publishing was really challenging. So we decided that uh, we could help by getting books discovered, books that we wanted to read. And I didn't mention this yet, but a more recent development that we just started this year. And this wasn't even really in response from COVID, response to COVID, it was a response um, to what happened at the end of last year. Uh, in January, we started an online book club where we, it is called the My Librarian Book Club, and it's where we feature an author every month and we actually sell the book. We have a partnership with the author where we sell the book to our subscribers. So every month this year, we have sold books for indie authors, and then we have them doing book talk and we market their book all month. So that is kind of like a natural extension out of, of the recommendation engine. It's so what we do almost is book marketing now because I found I, I had a need to market my books. And uh, I know a lot of librarians do this for authors. I hear from authors all the time that librarians are their biggest cheerleaders. And there are author talks at libraries all the time. But we decided to focus on indie books because many indie books aren't carried in, in libraries yet. You know, maybe you could, uh, you know, if you really love an indie author, you could submit it to your uh, library and they could possibly start carrying the book. So, you know, that's what we want to do. We, we want to help indie authors and small press authors that are overlooked by um, large publishers, but who still write quality content and need to be discovered. That's amazing. I love that. Um, I also want to know, being, doing a startup is a really big deal and I know it's like not easy at all and it takes a long time. So what would, what advice would you have for somebody who chooses to like go down this digital path? There's a lot of uh, learnings on, in the lean startup methodology uh, section of startups. <laughs> and uh, so I would research uh, lean startups and a lot of the what they tell you or what they suggest is that you could prove out the concept by doing it in a really low-fi way, low-cost way. And we did this before we built. So that's why it seemed like it was taking forever for us to build because we would do a lot of internal testing and testing with users. We did it at the Tech Entrepreneurship out of Stanford Venture Lab and we did it out of a lean startup circle. And then we did it with um, Factory X, which is uh, a, a bunch of X Google employees. And uh, we did user testing through each of those. 
programs and it helped us go from so many different versions. We had so many different ideas. The In The Stacks product, the first version, like what it was supposed to be, was kind of like a video plugin. And so, so it's, it's evolved a lot, so, so much. And so we actually built the fourth version of the product. And we actually have a fifth one in the pipeline. And that might be what people actually see in the app store. And there also will be a web app too. So, because I know that a lot of people still like using, you know, their computer. And, you know, mobile growth has been slow, but it's definitely picking up the last few years. So, um, I don't know, there's so much more I could say, and I hope I'm answering the question thoroughly. If I'm not, you know, just, you know, reframe the question and ask again, or ask additional questions, please. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Michelle. So I know there are a few questions on the chat and actually my next question is very related to that. So um, I know that your um, e, in the stacks has been a journey of mixing v different disciplines in one space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. From technology to library sciences and even cyber, um, digital humanities and things like that. And you talk about, of course, going research and doing user experience and doing information architecture. So what other skills have you developed along the way? Um, and how do you develop them when you are in there? As, as far as postgraduate continuing education, that kind of work? Yeah, like when you're doing okay. entrepreneurship, I'm sure there are many skills you didn't have before. So what are the things that you have developed on the go while you were doing your, um, your uh, my librarian and in the stacks? I looked for organizations like Women Who Code and did a lot of um, intro tech classes to see what coding language I wanted to learn. I also did um, a lean ux workshop through girl develop it and so i put a lot of personal time into continuing education and this is where libraries can help because um my own library in the mechanics institute where i've been a member for years it's a private library in san francisco but we were um startup in residence there for a long time and they um definitely you know gave a lot of resources you know for to startups and i think libraries could do that not in small businesses but startups they could be a resource for startups definitely and um, much in the way they are for maker spaces i know maker spaces kind of has a broader appeal but uh, i definitely used my local library also there's something here called the nasdaq entrepreneurial center and you can they have talks and free workshops that you can sign up for and there are so many of those resources i think that's why i, I love being in san francisco and now they've all go on, gone online so i do have some resources on my blog i did a talk a few years ago and I put together a list of resources which I could update and share with the group if you want. So uh, let me know because I do have a list of a lot of the things I mentioned and there's probably more on there. Excellent. Yeah, we we'll love that. So I do have one um, more question before we move on to, um, I guess, the, the chat. Um, I'm sure it is a great journey and ask for, you know, we're looking into entering in this arena and um, what are the biggest challenges I would say that you face while doing this job? The startup journey? In general, yeah. Yes. Well, the startup journey, it's just really, really uncertain. And I feel that you just have to be willing to risk everything, which I really have. Um, it's a good time in my life because I'm still single and uh, it might be the reason why, I don't know, but um, <laughs> I feel that over the past two years, I have had to hire and then let everybody go three times. It's been a really, really, really interesting uh, journey. And uh, part of it is because we we're always too early. We didn't have a product in market yet. 
And uh, you have to be really, really smart with the money that you do get. We have raised some money from crowdfunders and friends and family and angel investors and some institutional funds. And this year we've raised through grants. So, and we are raising from more investors. So, you know, ideally, I expect to have a budget for the next year, but you just have to be really good at juggling. And there are times when I can't pay myself. So yeah, I have to be like be going for the freelance work and be going for, you know, the investor funds. And uh, you just have to do a lot of mindset work too. I think that when I started my journey, I started also started meditating every morning. And I've been, so I, that was 2015, I think. And so it's been five years, but we didn't incorporate until 2018. And that's when everything sort of uh, came together in a way to a more official level. And, uh, you know, I've also been really lucky to have done some programs like All Raise, which is um, a group of female investors in Silicon Valley. And they did a boot camp for us last August. 2019 and that was a lot of pitch practice and now I'm in another fundraising cohort which gives a lot of support so I don't know it's a lot because you're talking about you know fundraising and I'm talking about building product and they all tie together of course um, we do have interns most semesters and I'm all, always very very grateful for all the interns that we get we've had a fully remote team for the past four years four and a half years so i was prepared for this and we we're able to uh, hire more interns because more interns need remote work so that is exciting especially as we launch uh, and i can talk more about the library and ambassador program too if you'd like <laughs> um, i did i answer your question there's probably more i could say about it but let me know if you want more details Yes, you did. Amazing. Thank you so much, um, Brittany, um, Michelle. All right. So, Lauren, do we have, you want to go over the questions that we have in the chat? Yeah, so we have a lot of really good questions. Um, I'm going to start by reading them, but then um, if the person who asked it wants to clarify, I'll allow you to unmute um, or you want to go further. Uh, so, Kristen asked, she wants to know more about your research and book talk videos. I don't know much about those either, so it'd be nice to learn about them. Oh, yeah. I really, really loved working on these. And in 2000, I think it was 2018 as well. No, it was 2017. I started doing writing tips videos to replace the book talking, but I will go back to book talking. I actually did two this year. I'm trying to like sneak them in there. But I produced um, 199 of them, and they're on YouTube under Michelle Z from Instax.tv, and they're all on our website, Instax.tv. And um, I really, really love doing them. We did, I did mostly 60-second book talks, and then I, I started doing 15-second book talks. And the most exciting thing is that so many other of our librarians and interns are submitting them to me too. So, I mean, anyone can submit and we'll run your book talk and we'll post it on our website and amplify it through our social media. So, I mean, I really love to see people doing them, but uh, we can share our production documents with you if you're interested. Um, but what I did was I actually built a little studio in my apartment at the time. And it's so exciting with Zoom now because I have a virtual background, so I don't need to do that anymore. I can just drop in the picture of my old studio and I can be recording a video from anywhere. So what I've been doing, honestly, is I've been you know, starting Zoom and recording myself. And that's how I make the book talks now with my virtual backgrounds. And then I just you know, download the video, edit it in iMovie, and then upload it to YouTube. So I actually did a couple of our authors who are part of our book club. I did reviews of their books, and then I did author interview for Librarian Detective, my fifth book. And but I love I love doing the book talks, and it was a lot of experimenting. Britt, you did some great book talks, so I don't know if you want to talk about this at all. But uh, I used to use a script. 
but then now I've been trying like the more natural or relaxed book talk. And it actually works better when you just speak naturally, I find. But I used to have, a, you know, like a white shirt and put my hair up and like have the glasses on my head. And lately, I've just honestly been doing like just when I'm wearing like a black top or a white top and just keeping it really simple. But uh, I love doing author interviews so much. And uh, that's what we do once a month now. I do the um, author interview via Zoom, via Facebook Live. And the next one is going to be on Monday, November 30th, excuse me. And it's with Elizabeth Frank the author of Censorettes, our November book club pick. And Elizabeth is a librarian too, although she doesn't work as a librarian. She lives in Queens, New York, and she, and I believe she's a full-time author, but she has the MLIS. So I was really, really excited to you know, be promoting Elizabeth's book this month. And she's gotten so much press for it. She's been in Buzzfeed and at least five or six other places. Lit Hub. She, she, her publisher did a really, really good job with the promotion. And it's a really cool historical novel. So you can learn more about it um, if you Google her or ask a librarian. I'm just kidding. Or go to mylibrarianbookclub.com and we have a summary of the book up. But uh, yeah, book talking is amazing and I'd be happy to you know, talk to any more, anybody about it and uh, share our production documents with you and how, what our process is like if you want to create them. Oh, and a big part of the internship has been creating book talks. If people want to make that the main part of their internship with us, we've been, like the last two semesters, people have just been so excited to be book talking. I love that everyone's getting more comfortable in front of the camera and creating more of these because not many people were. 10 years ago, I felt like I was all alone out there. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of book talks and things that uh, you're offering, I know you were talking earlier about the ambassador program um, and someone else in the comments was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about it. Yes. Yeah, I'm really, really excited about this. And uh, I can get the document up. I'll just like read it. But the most important thing about it is that uh, we will have stickers <laughs> and we'll have uh, mugs and a tote bag later in the year in 2021. But we're getting stickers right like as I speak. And uh, for every, I think, like 10 users, you get some, a bunch of stickers mailed to you. But um, let's see if I can find it. And yeah, OK. I'm just gonna read this to you really quickly. So, My Librarian is a new book recommendation service, a community of book lovers coming together to share their local stories. You're able to sign up for the beta version at our website. It's in the stats.tv or mylibrarian.co. And the app is created by library and publishing professionals. And we aim to be the go-to source for book recommendations, reviews, and book club curation. The app will become an essential resource created by experts and used by everyone. It's in currently, it's in closed beta. It'll be available to the public soon. And what we'd like from librarians is introductions to other book lovers who want to discover the best books out there in the stacks, have a place to keep a list of what they've read and what they want to read next. And we're offering a fun incentive. 10 signups, uh, you'll get the stickers. With 25 signups, you'll get a tote bag, and a My Librarian mug will be sent to those who sign up 50 users. Um, if you keep track of the users who sign up, uh, you'll be able to submit the names and emails when the time comes, and then we can cross reference them on the back end. You know, and then uh, just you know, reply and let us know. I also, can I just talk about one other thing really quickly? Britt, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but our Veronica, our, our digital um, librarian, she's a virtual librarian. Did I ever tell you about this idea at all? And no. uh, mm -mm. she is like our mascot. Her name's Veronica, and she's going to be like, a, she's going to be manning the Ask a Librarian feature and uh, the chat, and kind of like she's a chat bot. But well, she's just, you know, our virtual librarian. 
like a mascot. So anyway. That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for indulging me and letting me read that. I just thought I'd, that, that, that is the email that's going out to our librarian at ambassadors like in the next week or two. And even though we can't share the link just yet, we're getting people on board over the next couple months because depending on funding, you know, we could have a link for them within six weeks, maybe right after the holidays. Totally. <laughs> Yay, that's so exciting. Um, can you hear me now? Do you want me to talk about user testing at all? Because once we have the app out there, we'll definitely be user testing. We'll be getting feedback from users and we'll have them do a SurveyMonkey questionnaire and we'll have a place to log all the bugs and our dev team and our uh, people who will be um, doing, uh, you know, the user testing and like uh, all of the bugs, the bug logging, we will be putting that back into the product. And as, as, as much as we can afford to make the better product, we'll continue to iterate on it. So, and I'm happy to talk more about information architecture user UX. I have my portfolio to share. That was what I wanted to screen share, but let me know. <laughs> Hi, I would say all of the both. I think there's a lot interested um, in the user. Everybody says yes, please, and yes. So I guess yes for everything. I could also, you know, drop the link in um, the chat, but if you want me to screen share it, I'm happy to do that too. Just let me know what you want me to do. Are there still a lot of other questions too, Lauren? Um, feel, I think it'd be a good idea if you want to drop the link, Michelle, if you don't mind sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe okay, little, I'll do it right now. And then people can look at it at their leisure. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And I know that there was also um, someone or a couple people had mentioned uh, that wanting that list of resources that you had mentioned a uh, blogging about. So if you could okay. point us in that direction too, or if you if it's something that you kind of need to dig for and find, if you want to send it to me later, we can make sure we email it to everybody. Okay, and I'd like to also just put out there too, if anyone wants to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I think I'm the only Michelle, well, I'm, I'm one of the only Michelles, you know, the only one in San Francisco. I can share that information with everyone and make sure they have your, your correct contact info. I found the list and I'm going to put it in the chat, but honestly, it is from 2016, so it's kind of old. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. So we have a question that we really want to read it um, from Chris Seitz says, are you going, are you doing any sort of human computer interaction user experience studies in your app? What sort of motivational aspects in your app using to encourage users to stay with and use the app or the website? Yes, we did concentrate on that in the early user testing and I really loved working on the user interface and I did do wireframes for it and test them extensively. And then I worked with an excellent UX designer and then our front end dev took those and put them into um, React Native for the app. And all of that is on the Behance portfolio, the, uh, the link that I dropped so you can see a lot of the uh, design that went into the My Librarian app. And uh, we still do lo-fi uh, sketches all the time. I have one from a year ago for the book club. And I think, Britt, you did a wireframe for the book club. And we ended up going with the Mighty Networks page. So I basically had to like, every time you like, there's always like some sort of, uh, you know, technology barrier where there's like something that, you know, a tool that already has everything designed. So you have to take your idea and put it in with what they already have created. So we ended up using Mighty Networks for our book club community and that landing page, um, we did design it. Uh, but when you, can, when you can design from scratch then you can stick to your original designs. And the way that we uh, looked at human computer interaction is just by observing people what, when they were interacting with our lo-fi prototypes. And we will do that 
you will continue to do that as uh, we test you know the app that's coming out it'll be interesting if we can't do it in person if we'll have to do it completely virtual there are apps that um, you know videotape people's interactions within the app so that'll be cool to use those um what i'm more excited about is the that the back end going more completely um into artificial intelligence and we want to train the data set with real live librarians so and i'm more of a back end person <laughs> and um we also have um, you know modified algorithms based on recommend recommender algorithms so i guess the the front end and the back end uh, making it as technical as we can afford will increase the value of the product which eventually i want to be widespread and i would love to have acquired honestly so uh, another question that was right before that one um from susan was if you would be interested in partnering with other online book group companies who don't have a recommendation engine Oh, as far as Reese Witherspoon's book club, that sort of thing? Yeah, I guess, yeah, other online book group companies she's in. Um, well, yeah, we love partnering, and we absolutely would. We wanted to be the guest librarian for Reese's book club, and uh, I don't know whatever happened to that. There is a big, uh, like, to-do, and I don't think anyone was ever named. So I've been emailing them like crazy, and I actually just met the met the product manager for Hello Sunshine on Clubhouse and I followed up with her and I never heard anything. But, you know, I definitely do. And we want to we want to work with Marie Claire. We want to work with Oprah. We want to just be like the guest librarian and pick, you know, a book for their book club for one month. And as far as working with from within libraries, we can, you know, help you facilitate your book club at your library. Or if someone is looking for a book club, send them over to us or if someone wants to form their own book club within our mighty network they can do that too but on our mighty network we have a general area just like you would see in like a facebook group but then we also have small book discussion groups of five to eight people and uh, those are private so only those members can have the private discussion about the book so we're, we're hosting little book clubs within our big book club we did I answer your question, but I would love to. Yeah, if anyone wants to reach out and you know talk, chat more, um, I'm gonna put my email in here too. A couple of other questions that we have um, geared more towards your MLIS experience. Could you speak on some of the skills that you learned or like what classes helped you the most in your graduate studies? Uh, what classes would you recommend in, what, in helping you with the startup project? Well, I definitely loved information architecture and I saw some questions in there and there's an O'Reilly book on information architecture and that's the one we had to buy for our class and um, if you look at my portfolio there's some client examples in there and um, I feel that you just do, knowing how to do content inventories and which is uh, all of these are tasks that are related or skills related to library science and you just have to adapt them slightly but um, looking at a website seeing what information is already there seeing how it's arranged taking into account new technology and like the new information that the client wants to express and then designing it through wireframes which are almost like blueprints so and there's really low-fi tools you can use a lot of people use sketch or even uh, figma right now which are really advanced but i always used omnigraphle and um sorry there's one called mockingbird that's a free online tool but then i would use one called balsamic and um just whip to get whip together the like early like low type like low five versions of the product and uh, i would do that for clients and then they would user test them or have internal discussions with the outer outside client and i worked on a website for a robot called cosmo and for uh, a yogurt company 
and uh, for a lot of other products like a, a beauty product, a nonprofit organization, and then for all this, this is all like how the early versions of our products started designing them and then testing them with users. We would even just show the page, like the wireframe page to people sometimes and be like, what do you think of this design? Uh, did I answer the question? But uh, yeah, I have a lot to speaking, say about, oh, sorry. Speaking, no, it's okay. Speaking of uh, user testing, I know I think I saw a question about that or two of maybe uh, our guests here that are interested in user testing. Are you, is that something that we could do and is, are you still looking for interns? Do you take graduates as interns? Yes, yes. Well, if you're not doing it for credit, we call them, you know, we call you volunteer interns and the workload is much, much, much less. But yeah, we still have sp spaces open for spring, you know, look at the intern board. And uh, for user testing, you can just sign up to be a beta tester right on the website. And it will sign you up for all of our emails and you can pick which ones you want to get. If you only want to get the app emails it will just send you the app emails but um as far as uh information architecture i just want to say that in the commercial world it falls under ux so it especially um with a lot of smaller companies they want someone who can also do graphic design with i found like if you're a ux designer and a graphic designer in one it's uh, easier to get hired, I feel like. So when I was doing UX, I didn't really want to stay in it because it wasn't um, senior enough, for lack of a better word. Like the only place to go would be like to manage a team of UX designers or researchers. I think there's definitely positions for UX research. It's just something called usertesting.com. And in this, like there must be tons of remote work for user research. And I, for as far as hireability for digital librarians, a lot of my friends also have go into taxonomy and work in play, work at places like Facebook, Instacart, Walmart, et cetera, places that have a lot of content that needs organized any, anywhere from digital asset management to uh, the actual products on the back end of the site and how they're presented on the front end to customers. That's where librarians could work. And that would also fall under information architecture in UX, but taxonomy and also digital asset management. But I did want to say a little bit about this. The, I did find the pay was not as good as what I was doing before grad school. When I went into grad school and I realized this is a San Francisco salary, but um, I was a senior copywriter and um for bare essentials here in the city and i was making 130k for and then so um, i knew that at the public libraries in san francisco the salaries were about 85 so i definitely um interviewed and you know but uh it's very hard to get your foot in the door i even tried to go in as a floater i mean i just there was just such a you know shift and like uh and disconnect in the salaries and um, then for UX, I feel like um, the salaries were low too, but they weren't, they were higher than the librarians in the city. So I don't know, but none of it seemed worth it <laughs> enough to me. Um, what seemed worth it was to take the gamble and try, you know, to launch my librarian because it was now or never. Because I was still, uh, there was so much job uncertainty that I felt like it was worth it to take even a bigger risk but i did want to talk a little bit about salary but i mean if you go and you go into some place like facebook or google uh the salaries well they well, for, at least for the bay area and i hear that they're flattening across the board if you're working remotely it might be based on where you're working or it might just be a you know national salary i don't know but i know that sometimes ux designers like at google make 160 to 180 and supposedly information architects were supposed to make 250 at the senior level but i have yet to see that i do not know where that salary came from it must be within corporations uh, um, i think there's a couple more questions um that i want to make sure we don't miss or uh if we do too i will we'll be sure to 
scour through this and then ask Michelle afterwards and then we can email them out to everyone. But a couple of other quick questions that I'm seeing, hopefully I didn't lose too many in the chat, but one from Brenda is if you will offer an import feature into My Librarian uh, so that current Goodread users can transfer their reading list to your app. Maybe, <laughs> we'll see. I know Goodreads is here in the city and you know, they're really nice. Um, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. If the Google, I mean, I'm sorry, if the Goodreads API is public, I wonder. Um, I wonder if we could also just do like a Python scraping tool, but I don't know if Goodreads would like that. <laughs> if we just started like scraping all the user data, even though if the user you know, approved it. I know it's definitely something because I know people love that. You know, library thing is like a big thing as well. But uh, yeah, people love Goodreads for like logging their books. And that is one of the main reasons we added the feature on our app. So I don't know whoever's asking that question, please be a user tester and submit it again <laughs> at the time, at that time, because uh, we should follow up on that. Do you know yet, Michelle, when the apps will be available to the public? It depends. Um, if you sign up, you will probably be like a private beta user where you can download the test flight app and uh, then go to the, the store and get a version that is not available to the public. It's only available to you if you have a special link through test flight. So you'll be able to have it on your phone probably by January. We just have to fix a few things <laughs> from the version I have now. <laughs> and uh, I'm also demoing the version I have now to raise money in order to fix those few things. <laughs> so it depends on all of that. But ideally by, I know who is going to fix the things. And I have a meeting with them next Tuesday. So everything is coming together. So, but if you are in, if you're on the list, you'll be part of that early, uh, you know, public beta or private beta, sorry. And you'll, you'll be able to get it on your phone, even though it's not available to the general public. And we might keep the private beta open for quite a while to generate interest, like some other tech companies do. Yeah. We'll see. Thank you, Michelle. So I have another question, more into the area of, I guess, metadata and labeling. And I know Christian, uh, Christian was asked, asking a question regarding about how do you decide to label and sort different food, um, books to make it more effective and be able to be retrievable and the searchable more effective? Hmm. Well, I will say that, you know, book metadata isn't copyrighted so we have been able to gather everything that's publicly available and we have all of the basic information that you would see in a book record but then we also have the metadata to do with what we do especially such as uh, the video or, or podcast review full text and everything about uh, the reviewer we tag keywords and we rate but uh, so it really is pretty basic book data but what it goes through is our recommendator recommend recommendation algorithm and uh, that I have a bunch of um, papers on this that I've written I guess you know it's the beginning of the white papers for the tech and uh, it is uh, like I said before based on the reference desk experience but um, I don't know. The book data itself is pretty basic. It's just it's the you know adapted algorithm that we've created is what where the secret sauce is. I don't. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's so there was a similar question about labeling. About labeling. Now, how to assign to make it more findable? I guess how you sort your books and um, what kind of things you do you. What techniques would you use, you know, to, I guess, categorize and label your books? It depends. Um, just when you're looking on the website, we do it by genre. And just the basic, um, 
keywords, but on the, I, I just feel like we have such a small amount of content available publicly that it hasn't been a problem. Um, we do not use any of you know the classification systems. We haven't adopted anything yet so far because it's been just so small that if anything, it's um, the keywords are in alphabetical order. <laughs> There's only 700 of them. So yeah, the basic book uh, labeling would be book title, author, librarian, reviewer, genre. Am I answering your question or no? I mean, it's, it's really, really straightforward at this level because um, you know, we just keep it simple. Thank you, thank you. Um, I don't know, do we have any more questions in the chat? I don't know if we missed anything. I hope we didn't. I'm sorry, guys, if we did. Um, I'll definitely be looking at this again, and then we can pose them to Michelle. If you guys think of anything, I'm sure Michelle would be happy to answer your questions too. I know she provided your, her email in the chat, uh, so feel free to, to take that down. Um, and if you have any questions afterwards, I mean, you can direct them to her, but you can also direct them to the assist email and then we'll be sure to connect you with Michelle. Um, and we can definitely share this, the chat and the recording with those who attended if you're interested in any of the resources that Michelle provided today. I think if there's no other questions, we're right, right at the mark of a little after seven. Um, so thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being here and, and providing some insight into this alternative path that we as librarians and future librarians can take. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody to, who attended. And thanks to the moderators. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys for attending. We will, for those before you sign off, um, we will be hosting, if anyone's interested in joining ASSIST, please join. We would love to have you in our chapter. And we will also um, be hosting elections next month for anyone who is interested in joining our executive committee. So look for uh, announcements for that. We'll be sending ISIL alerts. We'll be posting it on our social media um, and sending emails. So just stay tuned for that. Oh, there's one more last question. I guess if you have time for it, Michelle, um, it's from John. If there's any presentation apps like PowerPoint or Prezi that are popular or you found popular in the field. No, not really. I mean, we just use Zoom presentations lately. Everything has been about Zoom. Even when I've been pitching investors to I spoke at computers and libraries, everything is Zoom. Unless it's on the done on the